When there's an injustice against you or someone you love or someone you believe in, stand up. Don't sit down on them. You know, if they need you. Welcome to Popcorn Planet's Pop Culture Justice. I am Andy Signor. We got a great panel today. So excited. We got a first guest who's got a limited amount of time, but I'm so honored to have them. Oh, I messed up my name, but it's not real Lara B, although as much as I love her, it's Peter of the Lawyer You Know. What's up, Peter? What's up, man? Good to have you here, man. And Lewis Lecca, my favorite, who's been following this case like crazy. Lewis, how are you doing? Very good, but hey, no one confuses you with Laura. It's okay. Laura's <laughs> way more beautiful, so it's all right. You're good. He's pretty beautiful, but yeah, Laura's more beautiful. Sorry, I got to yeah. say it too. <laughs> oh, uh, I'm not, but, I thought it was Zandy. Sorry. They, Both they, of you they are. Love Peter hey, too. No offense, I saw the comments. Fun. You look great. They were. <laughs> do you get a lot of those in your streams as you're breaking down the law? Everyone complimenting uh, all the, am the amazing looks, Peter? I don't know. Once in a while. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Didn't want to embarrass him at the start. But yes, good, good looking people here. Kim is here behind the scenes. She'll be back in a second. She's here, though. She's just not following this case as closely. But honored to have Peter here because he is the lawyer you know. If you don't know him, I was just getting some great insight from him. And I'm going to plug him because he's almost at 200K. And uh, I, I I was watching him live. He had a lot of people watching. Congrats, man. Good on you. If you guys aren't following him, he does really good quick recaps. And I love him because he's here near Tampa Bay with me in Florida. And uh, he's, he's a good guy. So check out The Lawyer You Know. You can go subscribe over there, audience, if you want to help him. Let's get him to 200K. Can we get him there? Go sub. I know he's got a subathon. We always try to help our friendlies here and uh, go support him over there. Uh, and we're getting Lewis and Steph to 100K soon as well. Lots of things to work on. So go support Nerd Report as well as he gets closer and closer. And he's been covering this case like crazy. Uh, so make sure you go follow him uh, and support him as well. All right, well, Peter, I know we got I got a few minutes, like 10 minutes with you. So I want to go through uh, the latest news today, get your legal analysis. And then Lewis and I and Kim will break down more specifics and hang out with you guys for a bit. But uh, for this main topic, yeah, the search warrant was unsealed. Uh, we have the full document. You went through it in grave de great detail. If you guys want to see it, you can go check it out over there as well. But uh, let's just get, what was your main takeaway now that you've gone through with your crowd? What, what, what was the big surprise for you before we get to the list of items and things? Overall sort of summary for folks who don't want to read it all? <laughs> sure, I would say there wasn't, a, there wasn't a ton of surprises in it necessarily, but we did know that they were going to unseal it at some point, right? We thought it was going to be March. That when it that's when it would unseal automatically. Uh, but in the original motion to seal, they did say a prosecutor could file a motion to get it unsealed earlier if what it was protecting and why it was sealed went away. And that was one of the interesting parts when it was originally sealed. It was for public safety. It was for privacy rights of the victims. And it was to protect the police investigation. Well, if you have the person you believe did it, in custody with no bond, no bail, he's not getting out, the public safety goes away. If the investigation is done to the point that you can get your search warrants, that he can't hide any evidence or conceal any evidence or destroy any evidence, the person they believe did it, then that goes away. And we already have all the information from the probable cause affidavit at this point. So the privacy rights outside of the fact that they continue to seal the names of the surviving victims and just put the initials in there, that motion was filed to unseal it on January 17th. It was unsealed. Now all this information is out here and we see exactly what they were looking for when they searched Brian Koberger's, not just his house, his residence, but also his office. Now, Lewis, I'm going to come to you in a second to ask a question. So if you got one, hold on to it to get a legal analysis here in this case, because I'm sure you got some good ones too. But before we get to questions, like the big thing obviously was this uh, the items seized from the residents here. And, and just for folks who don't see it, one, uh, what is it? Nitrate black glove, type black glove, one Walmart receipt with one Dickies tag, two Marshall's receipts, dust container from Bissell Power Force vacuum, eight possible hair strands, one fire TV stick with cord and plug, one possible animal hair strand, one possible hair, another possible hair, another possible hair, another possible hair, one computer tower, one collection of dark red spot, collected without testing, two cuttings from un, an uncased pillow of reddish brown stain, larger stain tested, two top and bottom mattress cover packaged separately, both labeled C. Now, when you see all that, obviously lots of hairs. What's your what's your response? What do you think, what's your takeaway when you see this item list? So DNA on hair. I mean, I see the possible animal hair. Could that be a dog that was at the victim's house, potentially, if they can get some connection there? Um, 
a lot of the, the most important thing is the one computer tower, right? What are they going to find on his computer? What searches was he making? I'm sure you've talked about, or we'll talk about the Walsh case. I think it's called where the guy that was arrested for murdering mm. his wife and he's searching how to literally how to get rid of a body. Um, so Google searches on computers can come up and they can be, uh, damning for whoever the defendant is that they're taking this from their house. You can see who was searching, where they were searching from IP address, uh, one black glove is kind of strange. I, somebody in my chat said there was one black glove found at the scene or in the backyard or something. I don't really know where a lot of this goes. It's very vague, and we're going to have to see how they connect it once testing is done and once they actually start to put all this together. We may see a lot more of this or hear a lot more about this list in the preliminary hearing. Yeah, Lewis, anything you saw on this or want to ask Peter about based on the list before we go to more broader questions? Well, we well, I'm gonna go a little broader because we got this list is brand new, but we need so I need an expert to answer this question. There's a there's a gag order on this entire thing, right? But yesterday, someone reached out allegedly to People Magazine and said there was actually DM messages to one of the female victims. Only one people are suspecting it's Kylie Gonzalez, right? Because she was allegedly the one that got uh, the most brutally injured or brutally, you know. You know, uh, gag order. How does that work? And does that mean someone broke it? If Potentially indeed, it does mean somebody broke it. Like that's not supposed to happen. And what we're seeing happening in the days following is exactly what the gag order is supposed to protect and is supposed to prevent. Um, we're seeing everybody, and I'm seeing some mainstream media reporting it as he was persistent. He continued on even though they never responded. But I'm seeing others, and I know this is important to Andy to get the full context of this stuff and not just make it sound as bad as possible because I've seen other reporting where it's more complete with quotes saying there was nothing that indicated he was starting to get frustrated. We don't even know if they ever saw the messages because they were going into the message request file. They weren't even going into the main messages that she was seeing. So it doesn't even look like she potentially opened them. He was just saying things like, hey, how are you? Um, so those kind of things are important context to that. And if every dude that didn't get a response from a girl in a DM mm -hmm. on Instagram, if that makes you a murderer, we've got some problems. So I do think that there should be a lot more to it. And the reason for the gag order is to prevent some little piece of evidence leaking out like that with no context, no scrutiny from a defense team or cross-examination to figure out how you got it, where you got it. Did she ever even see it? Is that a rejection? To me, a rejection is an active term. And it doesn't seem like she said, leave me alone, creep, or something like that. So how do we even know what his response was to that? But that's not going to stop people on social media from running wild with it. And I understand that because in one of my videos, I talked about how a prosecutor can, prosecutor can use a small piece of evidence like that to really start to build motive and how potential people that would sit on that jury would believe that. Well, to follow up on that, because that's a good question, Lewis, but I, it's more broadly like because I was watching your show and you said the real thing that's damning for him, the most damning is the DNA evidence on the sheath, right? Like you, you say everything else, if they, if they didn't have that, you do wonder if you'd have a, a way to get off of this. But when you mentioned, when we mentioned these messages, which again, I'm thank you for saying it for the full context. I mean, but still knowing he was messaging this, uh, one of the victims, he was there, his phone's pinging there. I know that's not always as trustworthy, but still we have that, we have the car, we have a lot of stuff pointing to this guy interacting with these people. It's hard to justify why he was there. Is that going to be enough for a jury sometimes to just see all these moments of, well, he's, he's around this, but they don't really have the evidence of him being there in the crime itself, right? What, do you think there's enough here for him to sort of already have this closed, you know, case closed? No, I, I think the case is far from closed, but we also don't know the mountain of evidence potentially that the prosecution has. We only know what's in the probable cause affidavit. So they could have more as well, which could be more damning for Koberger. Um, but we also haven't seen his lawyer cross-examine the witnesses, have their experts explain, like you said, the DNA evidence, the cell phone pinging, um, and stuff like that. So there's just a lot unknown still in the case. I wouldn't call it an open and shut case, but I would call it a pretty strong case of circumstantial evidence hinging on that DNA on the button of the knife sheath. Okay. Got it. Lewis, any other questions for Peter? Well, I just wanted to also add that he is, he was friends with uh, the three women, not the guy uh, on, on Instagram. And he wasn't, he wasn't being followed back uh, and stuff like that. Is he starting to sound like a dumb, well, whoever the suspect, whoever did this, are they starting to sound like a dumb criminal? 
I mean, I've heard both things. I've heard that. Yeah. I've also heard he's a criminal genius and mastermind based on his <laughs> training and experience and being a PhD in criminology and cloud evidence and whatever. So, and I've also seen fake Instagram accounts um, that people have said have been him. So it's just, it's hard to really know what's true, which is why I always like to wait. What is going to pass the scrutiny of being authentic and credible and admissible enough to come in at court? That's what I'd rather kind of wait and rely on than even a leak like this that seems like it makes sense. And that's the other thing. We're three guys, right? Most of these things start with some kind of love interest going bad, a rejection, a breakup, an ex-boyfriend, a, you know, he liked her, she didn't like him, whatever. In a crime of passion, that's very common. And so it's understandable that people go there, but that's why this stuff shouldn't get leaked with no context just from somebody because people can't help but think. And there's nothing wrong with thinking and connecting dots. But that's what's starting to happen here. And I've said one of the big questions is motive and connection. So Andy explained it that, you know, in his mind, there are a lot of connections. I don't know. I mean, I, I still don't know if I would say there are a lot of connections because his car drove there 12 times somewhere that's six miles away. I drive more than six miles every day. So, you know, I don't know. Does he have another reason for being there? We don't know his side of the story. We may never know his side of the story. There's just a lot unknown for me in this case, but I do think, you know, as you pointed out, the DNA on the sheath is, I don't know how you explain that. Well, but I'm just curious to challenge it a bit because I love hearing that, but it's like, Absolutely. Why, why on earth would you be there at four in the morning, have your phone turn off, and then suddenly you're driving around the area of a scene that then, and then you're there after it. All of those things aren't just like, I'm driving by through work. Like, it just all adds up to like, well, you're hiding something, right? That's what it, that's what it reads to me. Um, but again, do you feel like this? Cause we had, we had a caller call in. It was like cell phone tower pings mean nothing. It's very easy to fake that. Do you, but then the fact that they were able to track not only the cell phone power ting, but also the car. And then he was at the supermarket at the same time using the cell phone and the car. Do you think that's going to get taken seriously or do you not sit, take it? The fact that he's there at those weird times in the middle of the morning, his phone's off during the crimes and then it's back on. You don't find any of that hard to, to justify? Well, what Lewis just said is he's a dumb criminal, right? <laughs> but So why is he thinking about turning off his phone when he goes there, but then he's dumb enough to leave the sheath? You know, It's like he was concealing some stuff, but not other. I just don't really know that. I will say there are people that are staunch advocates saying that the cell phone tower pinging is junk science. But I've absolutely seen juries eat it up. This case has all the evidence that juries like in today's day and age, like CSI, they've got DNA, they've got cell phone tower pings, they've got cameras showing where the car is going and maps of where he drove and where he could have ditched the weapon. So there's a lot of evidence for juries to hold on to. Um, and I do think the way that you're connecting the dots is reasonable and plausible and how a jury might do to convict him. Um, I just don't think we have the full picture yet. And again, I could come up with scenarios as to how we could try to explain that. Would they be true? Who the heck knows? But if Brian Koberger was saying something like, I was dating one of them, I was tutoring one of them or a next door neighbor or whatever, and that's why I was there. My cell phone died during those two hours. It was in the charger. It, you know, Idaho has bad reception or whatever. I don't know. I don't know. I do think that's what I'm saying. I think it's a pretty strong circumstantial evidence case that you're really stacking bricks on top of each other where you have the cell phone. Any one thing on its own could probably be explained away, but the cell phones and the cameras of where the car went, his DNA inside, the eyewitness um, report that matches at least loosely his description. So I do think that's pretty strong when you build the whole case around that. Um, but, you know, I still think there's going to be more that comes out. And you agree that this, that obviously they have more that they are holding on to and they haven't put it all out in the, in the initial affidavit. Absolutely. I think they have more. I don't think they have a murder weapon, but I do think they have more than what we know. Do they need a murder weapon? You think? Do they need it? They, there's not a requirement to have a murder weapon to convict. I think it would help. It's not the same instance as no body, no crime, because um, that's legitimate. It's very difficult to convict without a body. Uh, but a lot of times uh, people get convicted without the murder weapon, especially if you have something like the sheath and you can take measurements and see what knife fits in there. And if you can match that up to the wounds, that's a pretty that's why that is such a huge piece of evidence. Uh, Lewis, right back to you. Anything else you want to ask Peter before we let him go? Okay, so there's a possible smoking gun here. Maybe I'm missing it, but you get the two Marshalls receipts, right? One Walmart, it says, with a, a Dickies tag, but we don't know if that's all, if the receipt was for a Dickies uh, pants or whatever the heck it is. What if, like, one of the murder weapons is on the receipt? That's a, that's end game, right? Yeah, but who bought the who bought the items? The receipt well, doesn't house. mean... He's receipts are in his house, right? Yeah, but he's with his parents, right? 
Couldn't the no, parents have bought? No, he's this is uh this, this is, is his Washington apartment. Oh, yeah. oh, sorry, thank you. I'm glad you could. So this is all from him. So I guess you can't. Yeah. So is that enough, Peter? Or can he say, well, I didn't buy those items. Why else do we have the receipt? To take it a step further, they actually confirm that he's the only one that gets mail at this house. So he can't even say there's somebody else living here that may have dropped this receipt. <laughs> um, oh boy. I, I don't know yeah. what's what's on the receipt. I'd be surprised if he could buy that knife at Walmart or Marshall's. Um, but I, I think if it's the same murder weapon purchased, that could be pretty damning. I think more likely maybe it's a black pair of pants or a black shirt or a black mask or maybe even gloves or something like that or even vans maybe because we've heard a lot about vans in this case. Um, but we'll see. I mean, we would just guess what's on the receipts at this point. So I think once we see, we'll be able to tell if it's important or not. The fire stick, <laughs> what could they get out of the fire stick? Now I have a theory because someone said he called into one of the true crime shows. I don't know if that was legit or not. What if he was watching that particular channel? Is that a link? I, I was going to say, right. The <laughs> fire stick should have a Google history of the streams he's watching and stuff. Yep. So that could be relevant, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I think a lot of people would be in trouble with what kind of stuff they watch, right? Like all the true crime people that are so obsessed with it. It's like, you're watching all this stuff. Oh, you must be into it, you know? So right. I don't know how damning that is, but some people, somebody on my channel uh, typed in, you can actually go online in your fire stick. So maybe there are some kind of like Google searches and, and maybe it is his YouTube history of what, what he watched. And if he did look at, you know, how to get away with the murder or whatever like that on a, on a fire stick, it is possible. I mean, it's definitely possible to find stuff like that with a fire stick. The only thing and about I, a fire stick is uh, it is very the ta to search the internet with those. It is so annoying, uh, hard to do. It's annoying. Yes, yeah. so if you have a computer, I would think he goes on his computer instead. Uh, I don't see why he would use a fire stick, but maybe search I never history. Have. Huh? I never have. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean you it's can, true. I have but... like I have the Alexa one, and it's like you have to like put the text in with the cursor. You're like, uh, it's very yeah. annoying to search. So it's probably unlikely, but it just shows they're grabbing everything that, that yeah, clearly sure. electronics. It's weird. There weren't like USB drives or other just things you had randomly around there. But, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, I'm surprised there's not more electronics or phones or something that well, he would have had. Don't more people have more than electronics than a fire stick and a computer. Yeah, but he was in Pennsylvania for Christmas break. Maybe he took his iPad, his laptop, his cell right. phone, Maybe he took that stuff with him to his parents' house. Huh. Interesting. Uh, anything else from you, Lewis? Before we have lots well, more, we're going to go through, this, guys. But it, I want to. Uh, sorry, but all this information coming out, in your opinion, is it better for the defense or the prosecutors? Because uh, now it's giving all this until June, right? The defense could just come up with stories why he, all these items were at his house. It's it's definitely better for the prosecutor. The defense already knows this stuff. The defense gets oh, this stuff okay. either way. Um, whether it's public or not, they have to let the defense know this. So through the discovery process prior to this pre preliminary hearing, it's definitely better for the prosecution. I mean, everything that gets leaked, people are saying, you know, this is just another reason why he's guilty or why he did it and already convicting him, even though he's presumed innocent. And the, the jury has to go in there and find that the prosecutor put a puzzle together and how we're looking at it right now, there's not even a puzzle on the table. So how you can say the puzzle is fully put together is tough. I can understand people saying if I was on the jury, this would be enough evidence and that's fair, fair conversation. But, you know, he's presumed innocent right now in our system. And I think most of us would want that to be taken seriously if we were in his situation. Well right. said, uh, Katrina says, uh, Peter, you're taking over the Internet hearts to Peter. <laughs> that's so what true. And you guys, if you want to help uh, get uh, help him, go subscribe. He's got 184. Let's get him 185. There's enough of you watching. Let's push him over that next hump. And uh, go subscribe to Lawyer Know. Uh, Peter, always a pleasure having you. Check your text. I want to try, hopefully you can join us next week or sometime. Always a pleasure to see you, sir. Anything you need, let me know. And uh, enjoy the rest of your night. Appreciate it. Good to meet Thanks, you. Take man. care, my man. Thank you, Ben. Bye-bye. Uh, lovely having him. He was having a great stream over there. I was learning a lot from his uh, breakdown. So glad we got to sneak him in before uh, he had to go out for the evening. But, Lewis, yeah, let's break more of this down. Uh, we're going to break it down. If you want to watch the full video with our coverage and more, and it's Kim's going to come in for some more coverage, hit that join button. You'll be able to watch the full replays. Pick a tier. You'll be supporting the channel, and you'll be able to watch all our extra shows and whatnot, as well as member-only videos. There was one I dropped today uh, that I had to turn members only. I'll explain in a bit, but lots of content you can watch over there on Popcorn Planet as a member. So thanks to all my members out there. Go, Planet. You guys are amazing. Uh, thank you guys so much for watching on the replay.